When Hitler triumphed in the summer of 1940, hailed by the Germans, his people saw him as an infallible genius, endowed with intelligence out of the ordinary. Meanwhile, it's just made up. The Hitler myth sold to the Germans is about the Fuhrer who knows everything, who works day and night, he whose light never fades. It's the opposite of reality. Hitler is a dilettante, he is someone who has never worked. He's someone who can't bear a long-term intellectual effort and long-winded effort. He can't read a file of more than 20 pages. Hitler is not working. In fact, Hitler likes to stay in his refuge, like an artist that hovers above reality. A handful of collaborators work for him. They are Joseph Goebbels, Heinrich Himmler, or Albert Speer. It took Hitler more than 15 years to recruit them. It seems today that he's a good human resources manager. He surrounded himself very well by choosing companions who always brought him something extra. Who are these men Hitler's shadow? What is the role of each person? Around the Fuhrer, there is a vast network of collaborators. First of all, there is the close guard, they are the only ones who have direct access to him. Among his followers, an essential trio was formed the first character is Hermann Göring. It's an ogre whose only thought is getting rich. Bulimia, opportunistic, drug addict, he likes luxury and the extravagances. The second, Joseph Goebbels, is a failed writer. His leg disability is a complex issue. He takes his revenge through radical hatred. He only lives through his idol, Hitler. The third, Heimer Kimmler, is a petty bourgeois, cold, narrow-minded, meticulous. A simple man who will become the assassin of the century by organizing what the Nazis call the final solution. The second group is composed of younger men with more ambition they joined Hitler in the 1930s when he came to power and assigned the ministries. Among them, Albert Speer makes it to the top. Under the features of a distinguished architect, he is, as a matter of fact, a great manipulator who shares Hitler's megalomaniac dreams and will do anything to become his favorite. At last, at the bottom, there are the implementers in the field, civil servants of the Third Reich who are commit the crimes and the atrocities. Like Rudolf Hoess, commander from the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp, completely cold and contemptuous. This father who settled in with his wife and five children in a house at the edge of the camp will organize the extermination of 1.1 million people. At his side, Dr. Joseph Mengel. He is in charge of medical experiments. He embodies the cruelty of the Nazis. Without any mercy for his victims, this SS doctor will carry out the worst mutilations in the camps, including on children. Without them, the worst crimes would not have been possible. To please Hitler, they are competing. In front of Hitler, they all hate each other. It's the way they function in this small community, encouraged by Hitler, which arouses rivalries, competition and emulation. Hitler, still unknown, is going to recruit his accomplices in the early 20s in a disturbed Germany. The vanquished of the First World War only have one army of 100,000 men left. So everywhere, former soldiers form more mercenary groups. The country is afraid of tipping in the Civil War. In this procession, a small group from southern Germany has chosen as symbol the swastika. They are called the National Socialist German Workers' Party, NSDAP. 
Founded in Munich, this small party attracts workers and the unemployed. In the front row of spectators, Hitler, age 30, small army employee, but not yet its leader, he is only its 55th member. This 14 to 18 veteran fought on the front at the rank of simple corporal. Since the defeat, all he wants is to avenge Germany. Hitler quickly prevails as leader of the small party when he takes the floor in Munich breweries. He denounces humiliations inflicted on his country, but his resources are still very limited. Equipped in this back brewery room, this was his first office. He wrote his speeches on this corner of the table. For more feedback, Hitler needs more prestigious representatives. In the fall of 1922, when a celebrity came to listen to him, he thought he had found an ideal candidate. Hitler was full of joy because at the moment, he believed they found someone wealthy, a war hero, he thought it was the propaganda they needed, that it was someone they absolutely needed as a member of their party. The new recruit is brave. Hermann Göring, age 27, was a fighter pilot during the Great War. Fighting in the sky. He shot down 21 planes. Hermann Göring was decorated for bravery, he received the highest distinction of the army. He was practically the only hero that German propaganda put forward. We made postcards and everyone in Germany had more or less knowledge of the exploits of this or that officer. And that's why Göring was very well known, with decorations, he was really the character of that time. Post-war, just like aviation, German military was dissolved, he is now unemployed. But in Hitler's eyes, Göring has another interest, he has high-ranking relationships. Göring brought him his prestige and his considerable social network. The aviation expert married a wealthy woman, Karen von Falk, is from the Swedish nobility. They met in the family castle, near Stockholm. The couple frequents the aristocracy, and precisely, Hitler needs donors to finance his small movement. As soon as he joined the party, Göring is immediately propelled at the head of the armed militia, called SA. Less than a year later, in Munich, the Nazi party wants to take power by a coup d'état. During this putsch of November 1923, a shootout breaks out between the Nazis and the police. There are 16 dead. For the Nazis, it's a total failure. Hitler was locked up for eight months in the Landsberg Fortress prison, his party is dissolved. In a cell, he writes Main Kampf, in English, My Fight. Seriously injured, Goering, on the other hand, is on the run. He's inadmissible on German soil. He needs to be operated, and he's being treated with morphine to reduce his pain. He becomes addicted to drugs. Goering seeks refuge in Stockholm, his wife's country. Without any profession and future, he has outbursts of violence. It gives him a mental meltdown and from the moment he becomes a little difficult to handle, his wife prefers to put it in an asylum for him to receive treatment. Goering stays for a long period in this mental hospital from the Stockholm area. According to his confidential medical records, he was admitted for morphine poisoning. Goering is depicted like suicidal, egocentric. He talks about his mental disorders because he sees himself as someone who is politically dead. The following year, he got back on his feet. 
Thanks to the presidential election of 1925, an amnesty has just been proclaimed. He is allowed to return to Germany. Goering is nothing without his Führer. He hopes to regain his position as leader in the party, but his relationship with Hitler is not the same anymore. In the beginning, Hitler wasn't in the mood to see his former leader of the SA again because now, he has another leader of the SA. Goering reminds Hitler of the services he provided to him in the past. He said he lost everything, that he has always been his most loyal collaborator, and in that case, it was now his turn to show appreciation. Hitler meets devoted men. So he found a new position for him, Goering will no longer fight in the streets, he now has to conquer social lounges. He will fight to regain his rank. He only succeeded in 1928, when he joined the Reichstag, the German parliament, elected among the first 12 Nazi deputies. In 1932, he even became president of this assembly. The second accomplice that Hitler recruited saw his career in Nazism take off at the age of 29. Hitler started by giving Joseph Goebbels a very delicate mission. He sent him to Berlin, the capital of Germany. With its 4 million inhabitants, it was at the time the largest metropolis in Europe. It consists of huge suburbs where the workers are piling up. They call it Red Berlin because communists have made it their stronghold. Hitler gave an immense challenge to this unscrupulous man. He was to make Nazis the first political force in Berlin. And the Führer knows that he can ask Goebbels anything. He's a man on a wild quest and hungry for recognition. He finds it in Hitler, who he considers to be a charismatic man, intelligent, superior, and towards whom he develops a relationship not different from love. His relationship with Hitler is one wherein he is totally dependent, so he's looking for recognition, friendly gestures, kind words. Goebbels owes everything to Hitler, because until they met, his life was a succession of failures. Suffering from a disease in his early childhood, Goebbels is disabled, he is ashamed of it. During the First World War, he dreamed of becoming a soldier. Talking about his disability, he prefers to lie. He covers his disability by hiding the origin, saying that he had been injured during the Great War, and that he was a hero, meanwhile he did not fight during the Great War because he was not selected. Doctor of Literature from the University, unsuccessful writer, he did not find a job at the height of his ambitions. Goebbels worked nine months as a small bank clerk before resigning. Only Hitler gives a meaning to his life. He is no longer the little bank clerk, he is no longer the little writer rejected by major publishers, he is now the leader of the Nazi party for an important area, which is that of the capital of the Reich. Upon arrival in Berlin, the new boss finds only a hundred active members and small offices, everything has to be built. Goebbels starts by producing a newspaper, Angriff, Attack in English. To get people talking about Nazis, he chooses a radical strategy, stir up hate. Less than a week after his arrival, Goebbels sends his great soldiers fight communists in their neighborhood. Violent brawls break out. Massive arrests are happening. Police ban the Nazi party in the capital Reich, but it doesn't matter for Goebbels, the movement thrives on scandal. In this violent climate, Nazi propaganda finds a martyr. In 1930, a young activist, Horst Wessel, was stabbed to death by a communist. In the presence of Hitler and Goering, these funerals, with great fanfare, provide an opportunity for a demonstration of impressive strength for the Nazis. 
and Goebbels never stops adding fuel to the fire. Did he really deserve this death? He was courageous enough to walk in the storm, this young German worker, Justin Kraut. To reward him, Hitler offered Goebbels a promotion. He named it head of party propaganda. The third man, Hitler's inner guard, does not have the usual profile of workers and the unemployed who join Nazism. Heinrich Himmler is a young bourgeois obsessed with superiority of the Germanic race. At the party's headquarters in Munich, in this propaganda movie of 1929, Himmler is a young man with glasses. He still looks like a junior little secretary taking orders from his leader. Others do not perceive his ambitions. Himmler is the son of a good family. A Catholic, perfectly integrated in society, he is the son of a Greek Latin teacher who became headmaster from one of the best high schools in the city. He lacks nothing, but very young, he became a member of the most radical racist group. Katrin Himmler is Ernst's granddaughter, the youngest brother of Heinrich Himmler. This political scientist is studying the history of his family. The three Himmler brothers became virulent Nazis. Their ideology was similar to a sense of superiority, the feeling that the German people were above the others. This racist discourse also advocates a return to Earth. Himmler became an agricultural engineer. With his wife Marga, they bought a small farm where they want to live in autarky to protect themselves from the outside world that they consider rotten. On Hitler's side, Himmler is submissive, but he also has a real influence on him. Actually, we have known since then that he defended his beliefs. He often got Hitler's agreement for ideas that he had himself. Himmler, the young bourgeois, believes in Nazi ideas, but he doesn't like to mingle to rank and file activists who make up the heart of the party. In Himmler's eyes, these people were mindless fools, the equivalent of a fan club like Lazio or PSG in its good hours. In response, Himmler created a chic club within the party. These disciplined men in black will form an elite under his authority. The acronym of this unit in German consists of two letters, the SS. All must be of pure Germanic origin, they will be the most fanatic among the fanatics. In the night of 1933, Adolf Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany, again, he doesn't want to work as his role would require. He doesn't like being obliged to work every day, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., for him, it's unthinkable. When he started, if I may say his career as Chancellor, starting from a few days, he immediately said he's not the one to work. Once in power, role-sharing between his accomplices will make winners and losers. Goebbels did not become minister right away. As for Goering, he is winning. Hitler Lutz takes him in his first government as early as 1933. And no one is going to accumulate as many titles as he did. In 12 years of power, you just have to see the variety of his uniforms. President of Prussia, Grand Veneur of the Reich. Minister of Aviation, Marshal of the Empire. A bunch of decorations which triggered the jealousy of his big rival, Joseph Goebbels. 
Goebbels, at first, is quite skeptical on Goering's role. He describes it very well as the unbearable blistered balloon, puffed up with fatuity and vanity, a vulgar joker. A handsome one, in fact, a new rich person who wants glitz, who is strutting in ridiculous uniforms, covered with medals and fodder. He's a puppet in his eyes. Just that, Goering is also a strong man. He installed the dictatorship in 1933. When the Reichstag catches fire under mysterious conditions, Goering, the president of the assembly, attributes the fire outburst to the communists and is being threatened. I'm going to eradicate everyone who got positions and privileges, thanks to their political affiliation, red or black, I'm going to knock them down. A wave of repression falls on Germany. Over 3,000 opponents of Nazism are arrested without trial. Goering creates a new political police, the Gestapo. As early as 1933, the first concentration camp opened in Dachau, opponents are subject to forced labor. Goering wins points in Hitler's esteem. Goering is prioritized each time. Hitler is in need of someone to entrust difficult work to one of his collaborators. Joseph Goebbels ends up receiving a custom-made post, a big ministry for propaganda. The frustrated writer now has the power to choose authorized books and to ban others. Jewish writers' books or authors deemed degenerate are burned in major public ceremonies. Like that evening in May 1933, near the University of Berlin. You do well to leave demons of the past. To the flames, the German man of the future will not only be a man of books, but also a man of character. And to that, we want to train you. He is also a fanatic anti-Semite. When the Nazis came to power, Jews in Germany only represent 0.8% of the population, but Goebbels imagined a way to persecute them. Trucks are driving on the streets to spread a message. Let's be Germans and not Jews anymore. My dear compatriots, this morning at 10 a.m., we started the boycott of Jewish traders. Jewish-owned shop are pointed at with a finger. And the Nazis firmly discourage the customers from entering. Goebbels wants to impose his messages on the airwaves. And for the propaganda to enter every household, he purposely made a cheap radio set. This climate that he creates in Germany is particularly oppressive in the family of young Margit, five years old, who lives in Berlin. His father is Jewish and a bookseller and sells forbidden books. I didn't understand everything, but I could feel the atmosphere. We had received these people's radio stations from Goebbels, and I could always hear the Jews are our misfortune. It was Hitler's voice, and that of Goebbels, and me. I absolutely didn't know who a Jew was. Joseph Goebbels monitored everything. Theater, cinema, and he shows the news with the help of an all-powerful censorship committee. Goebbels also orchestrated a monumental presentation of the regime. Behind the scenes, he took care of the smallest details. Throughout the 1930s, during huge gatherings filmed as a Hollywood blockbuster, Hitler is presented to the people like the Messiah.
The career of Joseph Goebbels is at its peak, but his tormented character will get back on top. Goebbels is completely at ease during crisis, in situations of distress, of disaster. There he is not at ease, he needs noise and fury. The storm for Goebbels will come from his private life. He married Magda in 1931, his wedding witness was Adolf Hitler. Over time, their children will be used through propaganda, the Goebbels form the model family of the regime. Dear Dad, do you see us walking towards you? You already guessed that we are here to congratulate you, since you're celebrating your birthday. Helmet The first names of the six children all start with the letter H in homage to Hitler. Magda Goebbels, decorated by the regime, play the mother from an ideal Nazi family. And every year, a small sequence is staged to celebrate the father's birthday. Say, dear dad. Quickly say, dear dad. Louder. We congratulate you, really, for your birthday because you're at work and you don't know what we're doing here. Joseph Goebbels builds this image of a good family man, like Christmas Eve in 1936, where is he being filmed handing out gifts to the most modest little Germans. Thanks for the quick note. Do you want this? But reality has nothing to do with this perfect image. Goebbels is well known to multiply his adventures, he needs entertainment, actions, and events. Sink, he likes and knows cinema very well, as he has a great artistic culture, he participates. One of the ways to participate in life of the cinema was to do castings and to offer tea to some young ladies. He is known for being. I quote his nickname in the cinematographic world, the legend of Babelsberg. Babelsberg is German Hollywood. These are the studios near Potsdam, the legend of Babelsberg. In 1936, Goebbels begins a romantic idol with a 22-year-old starlet, Lita Barova. Hello, what? We are going on a trip, no? Today? It's a misstep which will have an impact on Goebbels' career. To put an end to this scandalous affair, his wife Magda, desperate, threatened to divorce. She confides to the couple's closest friend, Adolf Hitler. Hitler has no family, the German family is that of Joseph and Magda Goebbels. When this family starts to fail, Hitler is not happy at all. He is asked to break that relationship and to stop humiliating Magda Goebbels, a remarkable German woman and mother who Hitler loves. Hitler hates this image but also for Magda Goebbels, for which he has a lot of affection. He should lead Goebbels who suffers from it. Among Hitler's collaborators, a newcomer will take advantage of this and succeed in exceptional ascent. However, Albert Speer comes from afar, among men who join Nazism later on. On these images from 1935, we can already see their complicity. Hitler draws, next to him, in his flawless suit, Albert Speer, 27 years old, a young architect who hasn't built anything yet. In his youth, Hitler drew these sketches of pharaonic buildings. While dreaming of seeing them come true the day he would come to power. Hitler and Speer only knew each other a year ago, but they share a common passion for architecture. Hitler saw through Speer, practically the life he dreamed of. He always said he wanted to become an architect, and Speer followed Hitler's demands. Their projects were always gigantic, megalomaniacs. 
Hitler noticed Speer on May 1, 1933, at Berlin Airport, on Labor Day, which brings together more than one million people, a human tide. Hitler is fascinated by the festivities, which end with a grandiose fireworks display, where his face is set above the assembly. The organization is signed by Albert Speer. This grand bourgeois who just joined the Nazi party and to whom Goebbels placed his first orders. It's Goebbels who introduced Speer to Hitler, but of course, over time a rivalry was born. Goebbels always thought it was important to be part of Hitler's inner circle, and of course, in that case, Speer had become a rival. Quickly, Speer occupied a privileged position with Hitler. Unlike Goebbels, he is the permanent guest from his hideout in the mountains. Both enjoy the same pompous style that comes from antiquity. First of all, Speer is the architect from the huge parade ground in Nuremberg, copied from a temple dedicated to Zeus. For party conventions, this esplanade can accommodate more than 340,000 people. At the foot of the Eiffel Tower, Speer built the German flag installed for the Paris exhibition in 1937. That same year, Hitler is going to pass on to him the order of the century. Germany, the future capital of his empire. This huge project must last until 1950, it's about rebuilding Berlin. Along a 5-kilometer avenue, called Victory Avenue, the buildings of Germania will be the largest ever designed. At the very end, this cupola, which was reserved at the Great Hall of the People, will be 16 times bigger than that of St. Peter's in Rome. It is still the largest building in the world today. For the inhabitants of Berlin, it will be an earthquake. That's 50,000 apartments that needed to be shaved. Nearly 200,000 Berliners would have needed relocation, meanwhile there was already a great issue with lack of housing. To test the speed of his architect, Hitler is going to challenge him, Speer needs to build Germania's first building in just one year. Eight thousand workers from all over Germany work at the same time, day and night. They are building the future Reich Chancellery. To please Hitler, Albert Speer finishes the building two days before the scheduled date. Hitler takes possession of his building, which was supposed to dazzle ambassadors from all over the world. His chancellery doesn't go unnoticed, with a hall made of marble. A huge workroom for Hitler. And galleries twice as big than those of the Palace of Versailles. Albert Speer caught up with all his competitors in Hitler's esteem. The proximity of power fascinated him. Imagine that Speer was not even 30 and he had already become one of the most influential advisors of Hitler. In the meantime, in Munich, one of Hitler's historical accomplices, Himmler, did not get a ministry. He was just appointed head of the police of Bavaria. Ready for anything, he will lead a bloody purge within the party known as the Knight of the Long Knives. It's one of the things he has achieved towards power. Hitler fears the power of another leader, Ernst Röhm. Very popular, he leads the SA, a powerful Nazi militia recognizable by his brown shirts. While still under his orders, Himmler oversees the assassination of Röhm and his entire staff. 
Even at the cost of blood, if a comrade stood on his way, he wouldn't mind eliminating the comrade, even if it represents a great danger. Himmler emerged victorious of this bloodbath. His organization, the SS, the Black Order no longer has a rival, Himmler will be able to make it much more than just a militia. For him, the SS is a real political project in which he succeeded to convince Hitler as well. Himmler assigned a cult for the Germanic race. He refers to a king who died in the Middle Ages. He went and paid his respects at his grave, then he introduced Hitler as his successor throughout history. A thousand years ago, King Henry I passed on to our Fuhrer Adolf Hitler, human values, and the leading role for Germany, for Germania. Himmler wants to build a new society, a deeply racist society where the purebred Germans will be the only masters for centuries to come. So that the blood of the superior race can be spread on a large scale. Himmler founded special maternity homes where could SS give up newborn babies who would be raised by the regime. It was like controlled reproduction of horses. You take your fillies to the stables, there are stallions there, who engulf your fillies, etc. To groom the superior race, the Nazis also wanted to eliminate what they call worthless lives. As early as 1935, in every movie theater, these terrible propaganda movies are broadcasted. They show the disabled in a frightening state. The movie emphasizes on societal expenses, what do these patients, who spend their whole lives in hospitals? This afflicted woman of a hereditary disease would cost 153,000 marks yearly to the community. These three brothers and sisters, 62,300 marks. These epileptics, more than 20,000 marks. To manipulate public opinion, one more estimate of 1.2 billion marks would correspond to financial costs of all hereditary diseases. The Nazis wanted to justify the crimes they were planning. First you have to separate and prevent these worthless lives from harming the people, and from 1939, real killing programs were set up, including disabled people physical and mental. Himmler was always renovating everything, he also wanted his SS to have their own beliefs. I swear here to Adolf Hitler, fidelity and bravery. Strange ceremonies took place in the chapels of Wheelsburg Castle, the SS training center, with this black sun as an occult symbol. Baptisms took place according to SS rites. Himmler, himself, celebrated weddings. The Nazis want to erase all the religious beliefs that exist. If the Nazis had won, there would have been a new calendar, new feasts, new liturgies, a new baptism, a new feast that would have differed from Christmas. That's also the Nazi utopia, it's such an important revolution, and so global, that she had to change everything, everything, including belief and God. Secretly, in the mid-1930s, Hitler will take a strategic decision that he first shares with his right arm. Hitler, himself, sets up a program that, basically, showed the necessity for Germany to be ready to go to war in four years. In order to carry out this program, he created a new administration with a leader of the four-year plan, it's Hermann Goering. Overnight, in 1936, Hermann Goering is put at the head of German industry. His financial envelope is unlimited, his orders mobilized more than 228 factories, a firepower unique in the world at the time. 
The Germans, deprived of armies since the defeat of the First World War, are planning their revenge. My dear compatriots, my dear brothers in arms, what is the aim of this four-year plan? I could summarize it in one main sentence. The backup of German honor and the backup of German life. These new functions also allow Goring to enrich himself. For his birthdays, for example, the industrialists shower him with gifts. He receives collector's items. But he has a predilection for master paintings and precious stones. The corrupt system that he sets up is well organized. His office sent out small lists, just like wedding lists, to the various business representatives by telling them that the marshal would love to have this or that work of art, or this or that object as a gift. Hermann Goering plays the Roman emperors, he likes eccentricities like posing with a lion, cub. Yes, my Caesar. Are you visiting me? Come on. Are you full Caesar? Come on pretty, jump. That's good. Hitler points to Goring as his successor. Since the death of Karen, his first wife, who died of cancer, the Germans need a first lady, so his second marriage in Berlin is worthy of royal wedding. Thirty thousand soldiers punctuate the course. Hitler's witness chose these grandiose nuptials so as to hide his private life. Emma and Hermann Goering now embody the official regime couple. They represent Nazi power on special occasions. Like this one, during a reception in honor of Mussolini. To receive it, Goring had landscaping its immense estate at the gates of Berlin. Hundreds of works of art are exhibited on the walls of this palace. There was also a lot of trophies. Dieter Wellershoff met Goering several times. At a very young age, he was involved in the Hitler Youth, and at the age of 17, he was a soldier for a few months in Goering's estate. When he was reviewing us, Goering always said that once he passed in front of us, we could relax. We no longer had to, to stand up straight. It was necessary to choose a path without puddles and mud for this big and huge man to walk. It was grotesque. Though on the foreground of the scene, Goering has a hard time to contain Hitler. The Fuhrer is now ready to start war. Hitler regularly took part in fight rehearsals. Despite these huge exercises, Goering finds it hard to curb his impatience. Because he knows that the plan to prepare Germany for war has fallen behind schedule. He told Hitler that Germany was not ready yet. Meanwhile, being a year ahead on the plan that he had set himself, Hitler passes the order to attack. He lives in a movie, a play, he is, himself an actor in his war, appears before him like cards on a gigantic table, moving flags and checkers that he moves. For Hitler and his accomplices, the entry into the war in 1939 is surprisingly easy. The German army seems invincible. After a single year of war, Poland, Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Holland and France were invaded. 
Half of Europe was collapsing and the division of the empire between Hitler's accomplices was about to be bloody. The administration now depends on Goebbels Goring on one side and Himmler on the other, and we realize that following the policy of the conquest of colonization, predation and plunder, there is an overlap of skills, and all of this creates frictions, tensions. The big plunder began, Goering made Paris his hunting ground. He turned up in a convertible limo, roamed the streets, going down Place Vendôme in a palace, the Ritz. Goering came to visit French museums, Matisse, Monet, Cezanne, he took hundreds of paintings to complete his great collection. In the same year, Hitler also arrived in Paris, with his architect Albert Speer by his side. He promised to copy the most beautiful monuments of the French capital for their future Germania. Hitler was very impressed by Paris, the Champ Elysees, the Arc de Triomphe, of course he wanted to replicate all these in Berlin, but much bigger in size. Back in Berlin, Marshal Goering triumphed in the front row. He directed military operations, and yet, he hid it from Hitler. From the people's point of view, it was a dazzling success. According to the head of the economy, it's a disaster, because just few weeks into war, Germany no longer has bombs, no ammo, and very few planes. For fear of offending Hitler, Goring won't say anything. Boastful, he promises her he'll crush England in just three weeks. Himmler acquired an empire for himself in Eastern Europe where he supervises a despicable policy of extermination with total coldness. When Hitler visits him in Poland, his SS soldiers are already leading their big racist war. Himmler spends time motivating his troops to justify his systematic assassinations. He always tells his SS that it's hard to bear, just like a test, a painful task that they need to perform, but he says they were morally strong enough. He thinks it was more like a sacrifice. He said that he was sacrificing his psyche so their children could live, etc. There's a whole discourse behind it. At the start of 1939, in Poland, then, at the start of 1941, in the USSR, the Nazis were experimenting assassination policies and mass deportations. Under Himmler's orders, they built their living space, a colonial empire full of slaves and free from Jews. This project involves the death of dozens of millions of people through hunger. We are in an imaginary world wherein we let people die. At the same time, in Ukraine and Baltic countries, operate small mobile groups of SS killers, called Einsatzgruppen. These atrocities are happening one after the other at a frantic pace. Over one million people will be exterminated by shootings. In August 1941, Himmler surrenders in Minsk, Belarusia, to personally assess this killing strategy. He inspects first Soviet prisoners and personally assists these executions by bullets. Himmler, during a visit to Minsk, in the summer of 1941, will witness the execution of 100 Jews. 100 Jews were executed to serve as an example, to show Himmler how it's done. Himmler will fail in front of the show, he is one of the worst anti-Semites of the Third Reich, a convinced, rabid anti-Semite. It's not out of pity for Jewish victims, it's just that for the killer, the show brings trauma. As unbearable as it may seem, Himmler, as leader of the SS, worries only about the psychological trauma of his men. You have men who are not born killers, so there are different ways to get them to accept before they start killing. Following the killings in Minsk, Himmler is going to ask his men in Berlin to find a way to spare the killers. 
In 1941, different methods of mass murder coexisted. But at the end of the year, an order from Hitler himself will unify procedures. He asked for the extermination of all the Jews in Europe. Three years ago, Hitler warned that if the war became global, he would carry out his threat. Even today, I will be a prophet. If international Jewish finance, in Europe and outside Europe, was to succeed in plunging the peoples in a world war, then the result would not be the Bolshevization of the world, so on the contrary, the victory of Jewry would be the annihilation of the Jewish race. It was the entry into war of the United States in December 1941 which ultimately motivated his decision. The final solution was decided by Hitler. At that time, mass executions took place. During that year, almost four million Jews were exterminated. To Himmler, it is impossible to murder millions of people by mass shootings. That's why gassing will be seen as an efficient remedy to protect the killers. Gassing is not introduced to kill more people. On the other hand, the gas chambers have a major merit, which is to spare the killers. There is no contact with the victims. You no longer see people dying. You just pick up the bodies at the end. Himmler then decided to focus on a single location all these new killing policies. A gigantic place that will soon become the greatest concentration camps and killing centers. A place where one million people will be deported. First, it has to be a place pivotal to the Nazi empire. Two, it has to be well connected to all parts of Europe. And three, it should have a killing network, which is extremely fast and efficient. The real rail hub of the Nazi empire who will be chosen is Auschwitz. Himmler places Auschwitz in the hands of a field officer, one of the worst camp specialists. His name is Rudolf Hoess. At the age of 40, he became director of one of the largest projects of the Third Reich. These images of Auschwitz that we know are those of the liberation of the camp in 1945 by Soviet soldiers. To manage this vast complex, the largest camp in the Nazi empire, Heinrich Himmler, had to choose between several managers, but he chose Rudolf Hoess, a man with a murderous past. In 1923, Hoess murdered a man, a communist, who was detained in prison for five years. Upon his release from prison, Himmler took him under his wing and finally found him a new profession. In the early 1930s, Himmler met my grandfather and suggested that he join the SS. Rainer Hoess is the grandson of the commander of Auschwitz. Hans, his father, was the youngest son of Rudolf Hoess. He first had a job at the Dachau camp. He stayed there for four years, then he became head of detention, then deputy director of the Sachsenhausen camp, and in 1940, thanks to Himmler, he was appointed commander of Auschwitz. When he got to the town of Auschwitz in 1940 to set up a camp, Hoes discovered a small town of 15,000 inhabitants as well as an old barracks of the Polish army, where he established the first place of detention, Auschwitz I. He also spotted a villa, which adjoined the camp. Hoes took over the house, whose Polish owners were expropriated. On the second floor, from his office window, the view from the crematorium didn't bother him. The commander settled in the villa with his wife Edwidge and their five children. The family only thinks of his social ascent. The photos from the family album attest to this, their new living environment ensures unexpected comfort. At 70 meters crematory ovens, the garden surrounded by a large wall became the children's favorite playground. 
It was so big that he could ride a bike inside. Today, it seems that at that time, my grandparents passed from anonymous to VIP. Thanks to the concentration camp, the Hoas live a comfortable life with a workforce turned to slavery. He has an inmate who serves as a gardener, prisoners who serve as servants inside the house, who could look after children if needed. Anyways, there is everything to gain from gentrification in Auschwitz. My grandfather said in his memoirs that it was paradise. Like all SS officials, Hoas is constantly motivated by Himmler, whose arguments have only been recorded once, for internal use. Most of you know what 100 corpses look like, 500 or 1,000 corpses. Having held under these circumstances, and remained dignified, apart from a few cases of human failure, it has hardened us. It is a glorious page in our history that was never written, and never again will be. As early as 1941, Himmler asked Hoas to let Auschwitz reach the industrial scale to receive more convoys. The red brick building's old barracks are no longer enough. Three kilometers away from this first site began the construction of Birkenau, a gigantic concentration camp, but also a center of execution where as soon as they arrive, the deportees are sent directly into the gas chambers. Hoas also used prisoners to supply manpower to a whole industrial complex. A large chemical factory was set up, at the edge of technology at the time, it manufactured rubber for tires. The Auschwitz complex, that is the camps, the city, the factories, it's a permanent and incessant construction site from 1940 to almost 1945, at the end of the war, Auschwitz was constantly diversifying. After this huge factory, Hoas developed a major agricultural project with Himmler. He shared that with Heinrich Himmler, who did, as from 1918, started agronomy studies, so they had a common goal. Hoas was in charge of renting these greenhouses for research on new plants. Starting in 1943, the Birkenau camp became huge. The new agricultural hub settled in a small hamlet, Rajsko. During the war, Auschwitz became a model city for the Nazis. The population was multiplied by four. Within the camp, alongside Rudolf Hoas, another major Nazi criminal also took advantage of convoys who arrived in Auschwitz. Sons of wealthy industrialists, Dr. Joseph Mengel, conducted medical experiments. Mengel led official research within an official framework in the concentration camp. He was leading, in a way just like at the butcher shop. In the medical services and medical academies of the camp, the Nazi doctors carried out atrocious mutilations, especially on Jewish and Gypsy deportees. These doctors were given all power over individuals who were no longer considered as human beings, but as human material on which we'll proceed to all searches we consider necessary to make medicine evolve in this or that department. Does Dr. Mengel's experiences require children? In this column of small survivors, filmed here in 1945, in the front row, two little twin sisters were shaking hands. Jewish women from Hungary, their names are Miriam and Eva, 11 years old at the time. We were little children, little girls, between the ages of 2 and 16, starved for food. We had no rights. We had a fierce determination to live one more day. When they got to the Auschwitz-Birkenau Wharf in 1944 with the five members of their family, as soon as they get off the train, Eva must undergo the selection operated by the SS who receive the convoys and work for Mengel. Nazis running, yelling in German, twins, twins, and he noticed Miriam and me, we were dressed alike, we looked alike, and he demanded to know from my mother if we were twins, and my mother asked, 
Is that good? And the Nazi nodded yes. At that moment, another Nazi came, pulled my mother in one direction. We were pulled in the opposite direction. We were crying, she was crying. Stripped of their belongings, four members of her family were sent to the gas chamber. If Eva and her sister survived to that, it was to be used for the experiences of Dr. Mengel. Every day, they were driven to the medical service of the camp that he headed. Take a lot of blood from my left arm and give me a minimum of five injections into my right arm. The content of those injections we didn't know then, and unfortunately, I still do not know today. These injections make Eva ill with a very high fever. Next morning, Dr. Mengele came in with four other doctors. He never, ever examined me. All he did, he looked at my fever chart. And then he declared laughing sarcastically. He said, too bad. She's so young, she has only two weeks to live. These experiments by Mengele on the twins, the acts of torture, play a strategic role for the Nazis. At the very heart of Nazi ideology, there was this idea that Aryan blood is rare and everything needed to be done to promote reproduction and allow the growth of the Aryan population, so you have to try to find a method which allows the birth of twins or triplets. They were trying the older twins who were in reproductive age to mate female and male twins to see if the female got pregnant, if she would have twins. Because they were very interested in increasing the Aryan race. Eva and her sister survived, forever marked by severe physical disabilities. 1.1 million people died in Auschwitz. Starting at the end of 1941, Hitler and his accomplices experienced their first setback. To Goering, waging war at the same time, in the west and east of Europe, was crazy, but again, he is not fighting Hitler. At the beginning, Goering was very skeptical about an offensive to the east, and then he realized very quickly that apparently, Hitler had made up his mind. That's the rule for Goering, if Hitler took a decision, it was up to him to obey orders. Goering was right. Faced with the USSR, the German army had not planned the frosty winter, the troops are running out. In front of Stalingrad, the losses are huge. At that time, the young Dieter has left the Hitler Youth to the Russian front, where he fought in the Hermann Goering division. The young soldier is only 17 years old. What I learned from adults who were present is that Goering had a different opinion of Hitler. He did not want war. During a conversation with Hitler, Goering said he didn't want to play a game of chance, and Hitler said he had always played a game of chance. Engaged in multiple battles, the Germans lack the necessary weapons. But Hitler doesn't want to hear anything. Among his close-knit guard, he looks for an accomplice who can promise him a miracle. Goering, who has already been at the head of the arms industry, stands as a candidate. Hitler prefers him a more motivated employee. He chooses his architect, Albert Speer. Hitler asked him to become Minister of Armaments. Speer said he had no training in this field. Hitler insisted saying he was going to do it, so he accepted this mission. Without Speer, the war would not have lasted that long. The Rhine Minister for Armaments and War Production, Albert Speer, visiting an arms company, thanked the workers for investments in the incredible increase in production. Hitler asked him to double production rates, but right from the start for Speer, the problem seemed complicated. The men are sent to the battlefield, while women replaced them in arms factories. 
propaganda encouraged them to give up their previous jobs. Not long ago, this worker was still a little sempstress in a fashion salon. This one, saleswoman in a jewelry store. This one, saleswoman in a perfume store. Yet it's still insufficient to reach the exorbitant goals dictated by Hitler. In addition, Speer was responsible for overseeing the development of secret weapons who should reverse the course of the war. Particularly, the V-1 and V-2 missiles that have been tested for over five years. These first, historical ballistic missiles would be able to hit England. Against all odds, Speer pulled off the miracle. While the country was witnessing bombings during the year 1943, like here in Hamburg, he succeeded to double the production of armaments. Cannons and tanks are assembled by the chain in huge factories, where workers work over 70 hours per week. But his miracle also has a hidden face. Because of Allied bombings, city centers were destroyed and some industrial sites as well. It is at that moment that the idea to, to install underground production came about. In the center of Germany, in a forest region 50 kilometers from Hanover, a sprawling project will be buried under this hill. The Nazis imagine a network galleries of more than 12 kilometers that cross from side to side the whole Mittelbadur mountain. You get in through this vast entrance, which is 7 meters high. The former mine is presented as an endless succession of tunnels. This labyrinth includes 45 bays, it's the biggest underground factory in the world where workers assemble the famous V-2 missiles. But it's also the heart of the system organized by Albert Speer. Thousands of deportees from the concentration camps are locked up in their night and day to work like slaves. Of the 60,000 prisoners in the tunnel, 20,000 will die there, including more than 2,000 French people. Albert Speer always said he's ignorant of these barbaric living conditions that make his miracle possible. Hitler saw him like an organizational genius. He decorated him. Speer's ambition irritates his rivals. Speer succeeded in instrumentalizing the camp system for the arms industry. We know that apart from Hitler, Hitler feared a rival, and it was Speer. Because he was always had a way to oppose himself on Hitler. The Speer miracle is not enough. News from the Russian front are becoming more disastrous for the Germans. 200,000 soldiers are taken as prisoners. Goering now carries the weight of defeat. His drug intake increases sharply, puffy, with glassy eyes, he weighs over 264 pounds. He feels useless. It's a personal crisis, and for this, he's trying to calm down while taking medication based on morphine or other things. It is at that moment that people mocked him the more, not only the German public, but it's also Hitler who was becoming more critical. However, on the Eastern Front, when Marshal Goering inspected the Panzer Division named after him, all soldiers still had to pretend they believed in victory. Among the fighters in this unit, there was the young Dieter. Among us, we knew that the war was lost, but you could only think so, it could not be said openly. If someone said that the war was lost and that it was all over, he would have been shot. To curb this demotivation, Hitler needs a collaborator capable of enrolling the Germans behind him. 
It's time for the most fanatic of his accomplices to return. Berlin Sport Palace, on February 18, 1943, Goebbels put in place a communication operation. He gathered a crowd of Nazis who shared their beliefs and also injured people coming home from the front. He carefully chose his 14,000 spectators. The English pretend that the German people are against the total war measures of our government. According to the British, the people will not want total war, but capitulation. I am asking you, do you want total war? He created spurred up fury in Germany. Do you want this war to be total and so radical than we had imagined? I am asking you, are you determined to follow the Fuhrer in hell in order to achieve victory by accepting the tests, the toughest personal ones? That evening, Goebbels, in a trance, will achieve what he considers like the most successful performance of his career. Total war. We want it. Germany must sacrifice itself completely, Germany will never capitulate. Goebbels is smart enough to understand that the situation is difficult, maybe hopeless. If victory is possible, it will be thanks to the energy, the will, and sacrifice. If defeat is inevitable, the Nazis will disappear with such a racket, such a crash, such an apocalypse, that they will be immortalized by their sacrifice. Goering, his eternal rival, has finally been put to shame. He returned to the forefront. Goebbels then deployed an extraordinary energy. He visited the victims from the disaster and bombed cities, listened to complaints, gave out medals, and organized soup kitchens. He's fully coming back in the foreground like a kind by Hitler in the background of the second Hitler for the benefit of the disaster. Goebbels also expanded the age of mobilization for all Germans. The men are now enrolled up to age 60 and the age of the youngest is lowered to only 16 years of age. Since the Allies are approaching, I decided to get involved. New recruits go to the front in their daily clothes with the guns they have on hand. Goebbels named the operation, the People's Storm. In ruins of Berlin, where the inhabitants rummage through the trash to eat, one more news will shake Nazi morale. In Normandy, the Allies have just landed. Day by day, the collapse of the Reich is looming. Little Margit lives hidden in Berlin. To flee the Nazis, her father, a Jew, went into exile in China, and from his hiding place, in July 1944, the little girl regains hope upon hearing news on the radio. Oh my God! On July 20th, 1944, it was the attack on Hitler and what I heard first on the radio, it was Hitler's voice who said that he had been saved by Providence and it had saved him. In this room completely destroyed from its headquarters, Hitler survived miraculously to a bomb attack. Around him, we counted four deaths and nine seriously injured whom he visited in the hospital. The attack was organized by top brass who wanted to negotiate the capitulization of Germany with the Allies. 
This plot against Hitler triggered thousands of arrests, torture, and murder. Speer, Himmler. Goering, Goebbels, now know what they risk if they betray him. But they'll make different choices. His accomplices are all supposed to follow their Fuhrer even if it means sacrificing their lives. They are now trapped with Hitler, who has lost his mind. In March 1945, he is idling. On these propaganda images, he sits in front of a map and in the face of paralyzed generals, who don't dare talk about defeat. He dominates them, he silences them, he rebukes and yells at them. But in spring 1945, he moves small flags and pawns that no longer exist. On April 20th, 1945, on Hitler's 56th birthday, it's the last time that they're filmed together. Goering and Himmler parading, apparently all smiles, but it is just an illusion. A few hours later, they give up Hitler hastily. Goering learns that Hitler decided not to leave Berlin. Goering leaves for the south of Germany, he fled. At that time, staying in Berlin was equivalent to dying. Soviet soldiers are crushing the city under bombs. In a bunker under the monumental chancery, out of the three main accomplices, Goebbels is still holed up with Hitler. If it leads to suicide, death, defeat, it's not a big deal because Dr. Goebbels, chief propagandist, will have worked at the set on the scene of this death, so that for many centuries, the myth of this death, of this sacrifice, of its disappearance, will resonate. As the empire collapses, Joseph Goebbels, the fanatic, addressed to the Germans on April 21st, one last radio message. The moment of truth is approaching. I'm staying in Berlin, accompanied by my entire office. My wife and children too are here, and will stay in Berlin. While the city is in the hands of the Soviets, on April 30, 1945, at 3 p.m., Hitler committed suicide. According to his last wishes, he appointed Joseph Goebbels as his official successor. But Goebbels is made chancellor only a few hours. When the Soviets arrived in the gardens of the chancellery, they discovered the charred bodies by Joseph and Magda Goebbels with the corpses of their six children that they poisoned before committing suicide. With Magda Goebbels, his wife, they agree that there is no future. There is no world without Nazism. So by killing their children, they're shutting out the next generation. It's over. Everywhere in Germany, the Allies discover the same scene, thousands of anonymous Nazis refuse to surrender and commit suicide as a family. Unlike Goebbels, Himmler and Goering are willing to negotiate. Himmler and Goering are politicians till the end. These are people who leave all options open, who calculate, and who want to survive. Hermann Goering took refuge in his residence at the border from Germany and Austria. Before he died Hitler fired him. The Führer appointed him like his successor so, on April 23, 1945, Goering sent him this telegram, classified as confidential, where he opted to replace him. If negotiations are necessary, I'll be in a better position than you in Berlin. There, he asks Hitler, if you are no longer able to take decisions, it's now mine to take up your duties. Hitler considered this telegram like a serious betrayal. That's why Goering is removed from all his functions. Finally, in May 1945, Goering surrenders to the Americans. His wife and daughter are under safe custody. 
Goring is still convinced that he will be able to negotiate he surrendered with others. He is a marshal, the highest military rank. Both learns that he'll be treated like a criminal. It took him time to understand that he won't have the chance to negotiate anything because it's a capitulation without conditions that the Allies requested for years. Hitler was also betrayed by his loyal Heinrich Kimmler. The SS leader is on the run. Since February 1945, to save his ass, Himmler secretly came in contact with the Allies to negotiate capitulation. He even authorized these white Red Cross buses to save more than 13,000 prisoners that he liberated from the camps. Himmler had Himmler played a double game at the end of the war when he negotiated behind Hitler's back with the Allies. We notice his disconnection from reality. He really believed that the Allies would accept him being in a strong position. He was finally recognized near Hamburg, and at the moment he was being searched in this house by an English doctor, Himmler bite a cyanide capsule, the poison that he kept hidden in his mouth. When he understood that he was not credible, Himmler hid among German soldiers captured as prisoners. He wanted to go unnoticed, disguised with a false identity. He died immediately. The assassin of the century will never be accountable. He wanted to escape from his responsibilities, not only by fleeing, but also by committing suicide and not appearing before a judge. On the same day, in Flensburg, and the north of Germany, the last Nazi officials are arrested. Among them is Hitler's protege, Albert Speer, the architect and minister for armament. In the summer of 1945, among the accomplices of Hitler's inner circle, Goering alone and Speer are still alive. At the bottom of the ladder, Hoas also survived. They'll have to face the judges to pay for their crimes. They're still hoping to get out alive. November 20, 1945, in Nuremberg, the trial of the century began. These American, English, Russian, and French judges have to judge the 24 biggest Nazi criminals still alive. All risk the death penalty, and for the first time in history, they will have to answer of a new crime, the crime against humanity. The first defendant is Hermann Goering, skinny and cured of his drug addiction. He feels he still has enough energy left to fight. He was in great shape at the time, and he really took this trial like a fight. Hermann Wilhelm Goering. From the start of the trial, Goering wants to make a name for himself. According to the American procedure, the defendants just have to plead guilty or not guilty, but he has prepared a long speech. Before responding to the court, that I be found guilty or not guilty. I informed the court, the, the court that defendants were not entitled to make a statement. You must plead guilty or not guilty. On these allegations, I plead not guilty. After him, all defendants will plead not guilty in their turn. Not guilty. Not guilty. No. During the trial, Goering is the center of attention. He still thinks he'll escape the death penalty with this strategy. He wants to defend Hitler's project for Germany. His idea at that time was to justify his Führer. The judges planned an electric shock. Nazi criminals must be confronted in court with unbearable images filmed when the camps were liberated. Shot images by Americans and Russians to forever testify the atrocities made up by the defendants.
During the screening, Goring looks away, he understands that his defense has fallen apart. With the images on the screen, he had very few chances to succeed with his idea of explaining and justifying what happened for 12 years. The cold testimony by Rudolf Hoess, the commander from the Auschwitz camp, will further burden the defendants. Certainly the prisoners were poorly treated, but with a certain method. They defend the Nazi regime till the end, but in Nuremberg, only one will deny his beliefs and pretend to know nothing of the Holocaust. However, he is one of the closest to Hitler, Albert Speer, the architect. Hitler and the collapse of his regime will be a terrible period of suffering for the German people. After this trial, I'm going to condemn Hitler as the one responsible for this misfortune. He claimed that he would have still taken its distance from Hitler. He was even considering to murder him. Of course it was grotesque. On October 1, 1946, after 10 months of trials in Nuremberg, the verdict is in. Defendant Hermann Wilhelm Goering, the International Military Tribunal, sentences you to death by hanging. Twelve defendants were convicted to death by hanging. Spears' strategy paid off, he is only sentenced to 20 years in prison. Goering doesn't want to be hanged like a mere delinquent, but prefers to die like a soldier, shot by a firing squad, the court rejects it. So, the ultimate provocation, a few hours before the execution of his sentence, with the complicity of one of his American guards, Goering got a capsule of poison and committed suicide in his cell, still convinced he is making history. He said that, now, they'll condemn me, but in about 50 years, you'll see, there will be small statuettes of Hermann Goering in all German apartments. Those responsible for Auschwitz were handed over to the Polish justice system because the atrocities occurred on their soil. Among them, Rudolf Hoess, the director of the camp. He will be tried and condemned in Warsaw to show the example to be hanged in the camp at his crime scene. It's scary to see the coldness in his feelings. He doesn't really express regret with regard to these murders. To him, he was just following orders. Years have passed in Hitler's close-knit guard. Only one remained alive and will become master in the art of lying. When he leaves Spandau prison, in the suburbs of Berlin, in 1966, Albert Speer is only 61 years old. Hitler's architect and minister attracts media from all over the world. After 20 years of detention, he is the only one capable of explaining how Hitler's regime used to function. When Speer got out of prison, he had already signed a very lucrative contract to write his memoirs. For the past two years, Albert Speer became a successful author. His memoirs, written in prison, were translated into 14 languages and sold at more of a million copies. He's a star. Speer is being interviewed on all TV platforms around the world. Why did Hitler make you one of his friends? Hitler never had friends and as I said at the Nuremberg trials, what if Hitler would have had friends, I was a friend of his. Maybe I'm making his childhood dream come true. He keeps introducing himself as an architect who knew nothing about the regime's worst crimes. According to his assertions, he didn't know anything about the extermination of the Jews. In the 70s, Speer is gradually being caught up through revelations concerning his involvement in the Holocaust. 
Particularly, we know, thanks to this photo, which he visited in 1943, the Mauthausen camp where more than 200,000 people died, and that he heard Himmler mention the extermination of the Jews. If we had known everything we know today, he would have been convicted to death in Nuremberg. It was a very dangerous personality. Under a bourgeois mask, he was hiding his true nature, that of an icy politician. Albert Speer will escape from the truth till the end. Hitler's last close friend died in bed of a heart attack in 1981. Joseph Mengel, the doctor from Auschwitz, also known as the Angel of Death, died in 1979 in Brazil, without ever having been caught up with justice. None of these major criminals who worked so hard in Hitler's reign own a tomb today. Their remains were either scattered or buried anonymously to avoid any gatherings from nostalgic people. Their traces are gradually disappearing. At the end of this road lost in the forest, without indication, these abandoned ruins are those from Adolf Hitler's favorite house, where all his accomplices used to meet.